The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many, but certainly among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Phantom Mine. Many of us know the type of person who would be willing to pay more for an article in the black market than he would be willing to pay for the same article if he were able to buy it legitimately across the counter. That type of person is always looking for an angle, for a connection through whom he may be able for a little while longer to put off the ignominy of going to work. There is nothing such a person detests more than the idea and the practice of a day's wage for a day's work. Those people are known as operators, and even when they continue for years to be small operators, they never lose hope that one day, through some miracle, they will become Mr. Big Shot. In their eyes, a big shot is anyone who does not have to work for a living, but who makes his money through lying, cheating, or killing. There are those who have pictured the swindler as a criminal in kid gloves, who wanted only money and who abhorred the type of criminal operation in which lives are lost. Such a picture is a sentimental caricature, because the truth is that to the criminal, whatever his type of crime may be, no one's life is important except his own. file opens aboard an old freighter which is tied up to a dock along the waterfront of a large eastern city. It is early afternoon. A bright sun is shining, but below decks on this rusting tramp, dampness and gloom prevail. Sheltered by this atmosphere, a man moves silently, stealthily along a grimy corridor. Then, looking furtively about, he enters the engine room and moves swiftly to one of the engines. He stands examining it intently, unmindful of the quiet approach of footsteps. What are you doing? Huh? I asked you what you were doing. Well, I, I, I was... Who uh, are you? One of the wipers. I'm the engineer of the ship. I've never seen you. I just signed on, sir. What's your name? Louis Jackson, sir. What were you trying to do to that engine? Oh, nothing, sir. Look, may I go now, sir? What's I... that in your hand? Uh, just a brush, sir. Let me see it. What for? I smell kerosene. I think it comes from that brush. Now, let me see it. No. And there is kerosene on it. So what if there is? Come on. I'm taking you to the captain. Come in. Go ahead, Jackson. Okay. Good afternoon, Captain. Good afternoon, Mr. Metcalf. Captain, I hate to trouble you, but I've got to report this man. Uh... Don't you just signed on? Yes, sir. Now, what's your report, Mr. Metcalf? Well, I was down in the engine room a while ago. And this man came sneaking in. He didn't see me. He went over to one of the engines. Started a fool with it. When I called out to him. Yes? He refused to tell me why he was there. Then I discovered he had a brush in his hand. The brush was soaked with kerosene. I see. I haven't looked at my engines yet, Captain. I don't know whether they're damaged or not. Well, let me know as soon as you inspect them. Yes, sir. 
Uh, do you wish to press charges against him? Well, that's up to you, sir. Well, I'll question him. You go examine the engines. Leave the man here with me. Yes, sir. And thanks for being that alert, Mr. Metcalf. You're welcome, sir. Well? Well, what? Well, that was pretty stupid, don't you think? From letting him nail me, you mean? Yes. From now on, Louis, keep away from that engine room till we get to sea. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of Agent Tom Allen. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Jim. I thought you were in court today testifying in that Dexter case. There wasn't any need for me to testify. Dexter changed his plea to guilty. Oh, glad that file's closed. Yeah, so am I. But it looks as if we've got one to work on now that's going to be just as tough. You? That's right. Just came in as I got back from court. The SAC assigned it to us. Well, what's the story? It seems a man named Rafael Fernando went to the United States Consul in Barcelona, Spain. He confessed that he'd been an accomplice in a fraudulent bankruptcy. In Barcelona? No, in Chicago. Well, the consul took Fernando's story and sent it back to the State Department in Washington. They, in turn, sent it over to the Bureau. Well, how does it get to this office? Well, it was sent to the Chicago field office first, and they conducted an investigation on it. Well, how long ago did this bankruptcy take place? Fourteen months ago. In Chicago? That's right. Uh, it's probably given everybody connected with it a pretty good chance to scatter. That's what the Chicago investigation showed. You see, the bankruptcy originally took place when Fernando, a partner in the firm, allegedly absconded with $250,000 and then fled to Spain. Have you read the Fernando confession? Yes, it's here in the file. I just finished reading it. Does Fernando explain why he waited 14 months before he finally decided to confess? Yes, his partner in bankruptcy was a man named William Gilbert. Fernando says that all he ever got out of it was transportation back to his home in Barcelona. I see. He says that Gilbert promised to send him $50,000, but that he never sent him anything at all. So this man Gilbert took all the money while Fernando took the blame. That's it. That still doesn't explain how we happen to wind up with the case in this office. Oh, the uh, Chicago office started to search for Gilbert. They learned that he'd changed his name and was headed for here. They didn't find out whether he intended to set himself up in business here, did they, Jim? No. According to everything they could find out, he was headed here to buy a liberty ship. Well. Chicago also said that Gilbert had not only changed his name, but that he was very adept at changing his appearance. Oh, this makes the Dexter case look like high school stuff. It's not going to be easy, I'll give you that. Well, let's go to work and see what we can find. Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, Mr. Grant. How does everything look? Your ship is in tip-top shape, Mr. Grant. Are you ready to sail tomorrow night? Yes, sir. When do you expect to do the job? Oh, and we're a few miles offshore. You've made all preparations. Uh, Louis put a charge of powder under one of the floorboards in the engine room. It'll blow a hole in the side of this ship big enough to walk through. Splendid. And just to make sure, after we sail, I'll have him paint the floor down there with kerosene. And you've got your story straight? Sure, After she thinks, they say we ran into a floating mine. That'll stand up. And take every precaution, Captain. Those insurance companies investigate every angle in a case like this. What do you collect from them, Mr. Grant? 175,000. And the boat stood here 120,000? That's right. (laughs) Sounds like we're going to make a good night's pay. Tom, you want to walk with me down to the teletype room? Are you expecting something, Jim? Mm-hmm. Come on. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. The SAC spoke to the Chicago office a little while ago. They said they'd have something for us on the Gilbert bankruptcy. They say what it was? No, no, they didn't. They did say they'd located Gilbert's ex-girlfriend, though. She was coming into the office there to answer some questions for them. I hope she can give us more of a lead than we've been able to get so far. Mm-hmm. I checked every hotel in town today. Nobody answering the description Chicago gave us on Gilbert has checked in recently. Now, he's been in town. I found out that much. How? Well, you know that list of offices I got from the U.S. Maritime Commission? Oh, you mean that list that came in yesterday afternoon? That's the one. Well, I called the men who have been conducting the sales. I found that they remembered a man of that description bidding on Liberty ships here six weeks ago. Well, did he buy one? No, no, he didn't. That's too bad. That would have been an easy way to trace him. Well, then, three days after he left here, he tried to buy one in Boston, but he didn't have enough money to get one there either. They've, uh, they've got those sales someplace about every week, haven't they, Jim? Yeah, just about. 
Well, I checked every one of them. He attended every sale there was up to about two weeks ago. Did he buy a ship at that one? No. Now, all of a sudden, he stopped showing up. I wonder why. Yeah, maybe he found a ship someplace. Huh? Why do you suppose he's so anxious to get a ship? I don't know, Chuck. Nothing in his background that would indicate he was interested in smuggling. No. Well, there's your message now, Chuck. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tom, this might be the break we're waiting for. What is it? Gilbert's ex-girl says that he's living here now, under the name of Harry Grant. <laughs> Good evening, Captain. Yeah, hello, Mr. Metcalf. I know I shouldn't bother you this late, Captain, but this couldn't wait. Huh? What is it? Well, you remember the episode with the wiper yesterday. Yes. I have something further to report. On him? Yes. I just couldn't help this, Captain. I've harbored a suspicion against him ever since I caught him in the engine room. So? I kept thinking about it all day to day. And a couple of minutes ago, I went to his locker. You did what? I went to his locker and I opened it. Well? I found some black powder and some fuses. Explosives? That's right, Jim. What in the world In would... my opinion, Captain, it can indicate only one thing. He aims to sabotage the ship. Yes. It certainly appears that way, doesn't it? Have you any idea where the man is now? No, well, sir, I haven't. But we can certainly... Captain, everything... Oh, oh excuse me, sir. Well, Captain... Will you question him, or shall I? Look, I've got to see you alone, sir. We have something important to discuss with you, Jackson. I'll handle him, Mr. Metcalf. You go back to your quarters. But you need the evidence against him, Captain. I took it from his locker. I have it right here. Captain, you better get rid of this guy. Oh, see, here. You better talk respectfully. Please go, Mr. Metcalf. But I can't leave without... I heard what he said. Get out. Hey, what is this? Metcalf, I've asked you to go to your quarters. Captain, are you taking his son... Do as I say. Are you in favor of his... Louis, why did you do that? Because that charge is going off any second. And he's been through your locker. He found some powder and fuses. Now he'll know I'm mixed up in this, too. That can mean we lose... There it is. What happens now? Now, When the report comes in, I'll alert all members of the crew to stand by to abandon ship. Well, what happens with Metcalf? Well, we leave him here. He uh, liked the ship so much, we'll let him go down with it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Already, the bells of our colleges have called nearly two and a half million eager young Americans back to their books and classrooms to be given one of the greatest advantages of all, a college education. There's a boy in our block who'd give anything to answer that bell. Brightest kid you ever met. All his life he's planned on college, then law school. But it's all washed up now. His dad's last illness wiped out the family savings. Now that boy's had to go to work to help support his two younger brothers. It's a shame his father never heard of an equitable education fund. What's that? An equitable education fund is a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. Now, here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's exactly the plan I've been looking for, Mr. Keating. I think I'll see my Equitable Society representative first thing tomorrow. That's the thing to do. See an Equitable Society representative as soon as possible. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Remember, from the moment you set up an Equitable Education Fund, you make sure that when the college bells ring for your boy or girl, they will be ready to answer the call. Now back to the FBI file, The Phantom Mine. The 
crime being committed in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is a serious one. But it is only one of the more than 5,000 major crimes committed every day in the United States. Your FBI cooperates in bringing this series of official radio programs to you because it wants to acquaint you with the ways of the criminal so that you, as an individual, will be better able to cope with every particular type of lawbreaker. Your FBI does this because it has a responsibility to you, a responsibility which involves fighting America's army of criminals to the best of its ability. But you, the individual citizen, also have a responsibility. It is up to you, if you wish to see the crime wave conquered, to see to it that you have a strong local police force, and that that local police force is adequately paid. Money saved by cutting police protection or by not allowing local policemen to earn a living wage is not in the long run money saved. For where protection is inadequate, crime increases. In one major city in the United States, a city of well over a million population, a survey determined that more than 50% of the local police were so poorly paid that they were in constant debt. A companion survey showed that crime this year in that city has risen more than 50%. Your local policeman's life is at stake when he puts on his uniform. It is your duty to see to it that while he risks that life, he is paid a living wage. continues in a waterfront house that is occupied by Mr. Grant, owner of the scuttled ship. He is just greeting a visitor. Welcome home, Captain. It's good to see you. Well, have you got a drink? I need one. Sure. Here. Now, I'll take it straight, thanks. Very well. And I'll join you. Let's drink to the SS Marion Green. The best ship I ever skipped. And the best one I ever owned. <laughs> <laughs> well, where's Louis? Didn't he come with you? I'll be here. He was in the other boat. They're probably still asking them the same questions they asked me. Who asked you any questions? The Coast Guard. They picked us up. After the ship went down? Sure. We rode for about an hour before they sighted us. Well, what kind of questions do they ask you? Where was I at the time of the explosion? Whether I saw anything? Stuff like that. Anybody in the crew suspicious that it wasn't an accident? Yes. Metcalf, chief engineer. What did he find out? That Louis had explosives. Oh, how did you deal with him? Louis knocked him out. We left him in the cabin after the ship went under. Oh. oh. Hello? Hello, Mr. Grant. Oh, uh, that's right. Well, this is Louis, Mr. Grant. Did the captain come in yet? Yes, he just got here a couple of minutes ago. Where are you? I'm still downtown. The Coast Guard just let us go. Were they suspicious? No, but they will be. What? What do you mean? Did the captain tell you about the engineer, Metcalf? Yes. Well, he's still alive. I thought he went down with the ship. So did I, but when we were rowing away, we... We heard somebody yelling for help. It was Metcalf, so we picked him up. Well, what did you do that for? Well, what could I do? There was 14 other guys in the boat. What did Metcalf say when he saw you? Didn't have a chance to say anything. As soon as we pulled him into the boat, he passed out. And where is he now? At emergency hospital. Hmm. Listen to me, Louie, and get this straight. Yes, Mr. Grant, what is it? Get into that hospital and get to Metcalf. <laughs> This is a tough one. I thought you had the right answer when you got that list of new registrations on all boats. If Grant bought a boat in the last two months, it must be one of the boats on this list. I agree with you there, Jim, but we've checked almost every one of those names. All but three. And they're all owned by corporations. Now, this first one, the SS Dorothy Drew, was owned by a corporation in Santa Monica, California. Now, the Los Angeles office is checking on that one for us. With a two-hour difference in time, we might not get an answer until tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, but there's nothing we can do about that, son. The second ship, the SS Marion Green, is owned by the Black and White Corporation. I can't check on them until tomorrow morning either. Oh, I did get some details on the SS Marion Green, though. What were they? Well, she's a 4,000-ton freighter, equipped as a lumber carrier. She can carry about two and a half million feet of lumber. Well, did you find out what the Black and White Corporation paid for her? Yes, they paid 105000 The last owner said that the Black and White Corporation would have to spend about $15,000 in repairs to make her seaworthy again. That's pretty good buy. There aren't many 4,000 tons around you can pick up for 120,000. I know. Now, the ABC Handron Corporation owns the third ship. That's the SS Edith Summers. There doesn't seem to be any way of finding out anything about them until tomorrow either. Well, maybe we ought to call it a night, Jim, and get a fresh start in the morning. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I don't suppose there's much up there. Hi, 
Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Dr. Elliot O. at the emergency hospital. Yes, Doctor. Anything I can do for you? Well, I called police headquarters to report this, and they told me to call the FBI. I've just treated a man named Joe Metcalf for shock. He came to for a little while and explained that he was in a shipwreck, but that the wreck was no accident. Now, let me get the facts on this straight, Dr. Elliot. This, uh, Mr. Metcalf claims that there was a deliberate scuttling in the ship that he was on. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Did he tell you the name of the ship? Why, yes, he did. It was the SS Marion Green. Thank you for calling, Dr. Elliot. I'll be right over to talk to Mr. Metcalf. What time is it, Captain? Uh, a little after four. We called over an hour ago. Why haven't we heard from him? I don't know. I can't wait around much more. I've got things to do, Mr. Grant. Things to take care of. Now, I suppose you pay me off and I'll be getting along. Pay you? For what? The job I did. Captain, I'd like to point out to you that there's a man named Metcalf who, by your own admission, may jam up this whole deal. So? The deal's jammed up. I don't collect from the insurance company. And if I don't collect, Captain, neither do you. Now, just a minute. I made a deal with you to sink a ship. So right now, that ship's at the bottom of the ocean. That was only part of the deal. The most important phase of it was making it appear to be an accident. That you didn't deliver. Look, can I help it if Louis messed things up? It was your responsibility. You hired him, Mr. Grant. Captain, that has nothing to do with it. Who is it? Me, Louis. Oh. Hello, Mr. Grant. Hello, Captain. Uh... Where do you want me to put your chief engineer? What's the matter, Jim? You look beat. I'm getting a little tired of these wild goose chases. What happened this time? Well, I got over to the hospital. My doctor took me up to talk to Metcalf. Well, don't tell me he changed his story. Worse than that, Tom, he was gone. He was... Well, how could that happen? A friend came in and took him out. He told the nurse he was a shipmate of Metcalf's. Did the doctor tell you what Metcalf said while he was conscious? Yes. He said he was the engineer aboard the SS Marion Green. You know, it's probably the boat that Grant bought. Did Metcalf's story explain why he bought it? Yes, from what Metcalf told the doctor, the SS Marion Green was purposely scuttled. And I think we'll find that that ship was very heavily insured. Metcalf's the only one, then, who could prevent Grant from collecting on that insurance. That's it. So the shipmate who came to the hospital and got Metcalf out must be one of Grant's men. Yeah, I would think so. You know, I hate to think of the treatment they'll give him. I checked every possible record. In every boarding house, every hotel, every rental listed at the real estate board, there isn't a single Harry Grant on any of those lists. Oh, Metcalf gave this waterproof pouch to Dr. Elliot before he passed out again. Oh? Said there were some papers in it that he got out of a drawer in the captain's cabin just before he jumped off the ship. For Metcalf's sake, I hope there's something in here that'll tell us where Grant is. Hey, you take half and I'll take half. I'll take these. Well, doesn't seem to be anything here, Jim, except some paid Wait bills. Wait a minute. I think I've got something, Tom. Listen to this. It's a note to the captain saying I'll come aboard about 10 o'clock to discuss final plans with you. And it's signed with the initials H.G. Standing for Harry Grant. I should think so. There's no return address on the envelope. Well, it's very common stationery, too, Jim. There wouldn't be any chance of tracing the purchaser of this stuff. No. Well, that's right. I think we might find out where Mr. Grant sent this from, though. Let's get a classified telephone directory. I think he's coming to. Hey, better stop hitting him, Louis. Why, you you afraid I'll hurt him? No, we want to talk to him. Uh, Metcalf. Metcalf, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Good. Captain. Good, and then answer a few questions. Do you remember being at the hospital? Uh-huh. Did you talk to anybody at the hospital? Uh-huh. What did you say to them? I told them all about you and the wiper. Uh, blowing up the ship. Uh, uh, how do we handle this, Mr. Grant? There's a way. Metcalf is the only one who actually saw Louis in the engine room, isn't he? That's right. And what's that got to do with it? Then he's the only one that can prove anything. You forget about the doctor at the hospital. You blab as sure as you're born. And what do you think my lawyer will say to him on the stand? I don't know. He'll say, Doctor, isn't it possible that a man of Mr. Metcalf's age might get hysterical and delirious after an accident like that? The doctor will have to say yes, and that will be all there is to it. I see. That means that if Metcalf is dead and can't be found, the insurance company has to pay. 
So I don't carry a gun. Louie does, don't you, Louie? I lost mine when the ship went down. You'll find one in that top drawer. Get it and take care of him. Okay. Is it loaded? Try it and find out. You're not trying anything. What? What is this? Hold it. Special agents of the FBI. Well, Metcalf's still alive, Jim. Good, Tom. What are you two doing here? We came here to serve warrants for arrest on the three of you. Uh, what are the charges? Conspiracy to defraud. See here, that's a serious charge to make without any proof. I think we've got enough proof on that charge. And when we get back to headquarters, we'll add another charge against all of you. Attempted murder. <laughs> Harry Grant, Captain Spencer, and Louis Jackson were all tried in a federal court and convicted on both charges. They are now serving long terms in the federal penitentiary. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was solved because Special Agent Jim Taylor noticed that there was no stamp on the envelope containing the note found among the captain's papers. He therefore reasoned that it had been delivered by some messenger. A check of the messenger services listed in the classified telephone directory revealed that one of those services had been summoned by Mr. Grant to deliver the note to Captain Spencer aboard the SS Marion Green. A further check of the delivery slip showed that the note had been sent from number 415 Ocean Avenue, and it was at that address that Special Agents Taylor and Allen located the three criminals. What was even more important than the capture of the criminal triumvirate was the fact that your FBI was able to save the life of an innocent person. And thus, once more, your FBI, by the speed of its investigative procedure, succeeded in performing its double function of protecting not only your property, but your lives. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Joe, I understand there's one thing you'd like to clear up about an equitable education fund. Yes, Mr. Keating. Are these funds flexible? Can they be increased later if I can afford it? They certainly can. Many young fathers start with an equitable education fund that would pay part of a boy or girl's way through college. Then, as the family income goes up, the amount of the education fund is increased. Your equitable representative will be glad to show you just how it's done. Look him up soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an authentic record of the operations of one of the cunningest of the criminal breed, the Confidence Man. Its subject, fraud. Its title, the Atomic Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. The director, Sid Goodman. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Atomic Swindle on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.